Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Transforming Transportation. We're glad to see you. I know we have a few more guests waiting to get through security, but they'll join us shortly. We want to get started. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. You'll see headsets on your chairs. It's for simultaneous translation. We have three channels available. Channel one is English. Channel three is Spanish. Channel five is Russian. And again, someone left a Dell laptop at the security. It's here at the podium. I'll try to find them during the day. So we're going to get started. I want to invite Jose Luis Aragoy, the director for the Transport Water Information and Communication Technologies Department in the Sustainable Development Network at the World Bank to, to kick us off today. Good morning. It's really a pleasure on behalf of the World Bank to welcome you all to this 2013 edition of Transforming Transportation. And to thank everyone for being here, particularly those who have tra traveled a long way to be here. Many special thanks to our co-host Embark, our partners, the Asian Development Bank, the Clean Air Initiative for Asian Cities, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. And of course, special thanks to all the keynote speakers and session moderators that will be involved during these two days. This is the 10th edition of Transforming Transportation. And I'm glad to see that every year, the, this conference gets bigger and better. Our theme this year is identifying big opportunities to scale up best practice in sustainable transport. This year we have about 700 participants registered. We look forward to stimulating the discussions. I still remember the lively debate we had last year about the shift, avoid, and improve technology debate. We are especially proud to be hosting a high-level session tomorrow morning with the Honorable Michael Bloomberg, Mayor of the New York City, and World Bank President Jim Yong Kim on shaping the future of urban transport. The dialogue between these two highly respected world leaders, both attending Transforming Transportation for the first time, is an opportunity to, to galvanize awareness of challenges facing cities and urban transport, share examples of uh, solutions from around the world, and spur action. We hope that these uh, two days will lead to action. You can all participate in the discussion by submitting questions uh, or comments on the World Bank Live website. Just type live.worldbank.org in your browser. We, you have time until 12 p.m. today to feed, us, to feed this discussion with comments or questions. Throughout the conference, we'll be addressing the challenge of creating safe, clean, and affordable transport for people living in cities around the world. We will look at urban transport within the framework of inclusive green growth as the pathway to sustainable development. And we will focus on financing for urban transport and how can we capitalize on the 175 billion commitment for sustainable transport made at Rio Plus 20. One key challenge that countries and cities face is the complexity of urban transport and the need to identify and implement holistic solutions tailored to the local needs. It is not just about building bridges and flyovers. As a matter of fact, we know no one has been able to build their way out of congestion. It is not about adding metros and buses only. It is much more than that. Issues such as affordability, livelihoods, political economy, local culture, energy security, safety, air quality also come into play. Majors and city officials, government policy makers need vision and courage to tackle this complexity. And I would like to acknowledge the efforts of all officials who are with us today for the courage because many times this action requires challenging the status quo, taking risks. We recognize that capacity for holistic and comprehensive planning is often lacking. This community stands ready to help build this capacity. 
We have several initiatives in place. The bank started one year ago the leaders in urban transport planning with some partners, Singapore, Korea. We have expanded now. There is a new, another one coming with uh, Embark in Mexico. This is an example of how we plan to partner with others to help city officials develop this capacity. This program in China has been adopted now by the Academy of Mayors and they are tailoring to the conditions in China and it's going to be used to mainstream capacity building in the country. This is what we would like to see happening. Another challenge which is often neglected is how we address the social cost of meeting the transport demand. Let me highlight two of these. Congestion is a highly visible cost, something we see every day. Fast-growing urban centers in developing countries are under particular pressure. Will growing congestion exclude the poor and disadvantaged from the benefits of growth? How do we ensure that growth is inclusive and that poor transport systems don't exclude certain segments of the population? You will hear the examples of uh, cities such as Rio that are using public transport to improve social inclusion and reduce at the same time their carbon footprint. Fair physical and fair integration and the technologies that are available today to do that allow not only to facilitate this process and make more efficient the transport system when they are integrated, but also to target subsidies. What a fascinating story we are going to hear. Another social cost of meeting the transport demand is the increased incidence of road traffic, deaths and injuries. Vehicles and traffic crashes kill 1.2 million people every year, 90% of them in the developing world. Road crashes are the number one killing cause for groups of population between 19 and 29 years old and the second between 29 and 39. And this is a problem that we can solve because there is evidence of what works. The global burden of disease is helping position this agenda in a health context as a, a, a really a crisis of proportion. They have discovered in the recent report that 40% of those being killed are pedestrians. We have the vehicle, the UN Decade of Action, which aims to prevent 5 million road traffic deaths by 2020. Let's think how we can strengthen our partnerships to support the decade and involve all stakeholders, not just the ones we already work with. These areas where we can really make a big difference if we work together. There is an urgency here if we, if we scale up our efforts in large cities where the problems are acute, but at the same time, helping medium-sized cities that are growing rapidly to avoid locking themselves into unsustainable paths. So let's take advantage of this today to identify opportunities for closer collaboration and bring more innovative thinking to the table. Thank you again for your participation and enjoy Transforming Transportation 2013 and your stay in Washington these two days. The weather as usual when we have our event is always playing tricks. Nothing can stop us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Luis. And I want to introduce Holger Dockman, the director of the Embark Network. Welcome and uh, good morning, everybody. And really excited to, to be here and seeing so many familiar faces and friends. And um, a big thank first also to the host here, the World Bank, our, our partner for this event, but also many thanks to our partners from the Asian Development Bank, from the Inter-American Development Bank, from Clean Air Asia, from ITDP, and the Sustainable Low Carbon Transport Partnership. This is a tense event of transforming transportation, and we have more than 700 people registered 
and many of them are unfortunately I heard still also queuing up and uh, I hope everybody uh, will still be able also to come in at, at, at some stage to really discuss the big opportunities on sustainable transport our theme today. But I also like to welcome all our guests and, and speakers. We have mayors, we have ministers here from, from, from India. We have thought leaders and we have key leading petitioners on the ground showing that sustainable transport is a reality. But also let me welcome particularly also our representatives and the team from Embark. Meanwhile, we have six centers around the world working on the national level with national government to enable sustainable urban transport solution based also on demonstrable solutions on the ground. And this is, is, this is vital. So we have our center representatives from the Andes, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Turkey, from India, and from China here. So it's a warm welcome also to them and, and the team, and it's a real pleasure for me also to, 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 to work with them. But let me for a second also remind us about the founder of Embark in 2002, Lee Shipper. Lee was a genius researcher, a crazy and excellent musician, a friend for many of us and unfortunately he passed away in 2011 far too early but he is leaving a legacy he is still in our mind but particularly in our hearts and one of the things we are doing together with, uh, with the Lee Shipper family to keep this legacy is that we have set up a Lee Shipper Memorial Scholarship for Sustainable Transport. So to enable young researchers also to do transformational research for sustainable transport. I'm really thankful here that many of you already donated, contributed, shared the, the, the information and a special thing, thanks also to some of the advisors. I saw somewhere also Sam Zimmerman just to point out uh, one of the many also giving, giving advice. But I also like to mention here and highlight the Shell Foundation who's supporting uh, that, that scholarship as well. I'm really excited. We already have um, 110 people, young researchers from all over the world submitted their application saying we have research which really make it make it make it make a change and next year we will present two of the best papers then here also at transforming transportation to keep the legacy so let's move to our two days today and as Jose Luis said it's a really exciting program for us, but there are also many challenges. And you're all aware of the big challenges, and Jose Luis pointed out the key issues. It's a trend towards urbanization. More people now in China live in an urban environment, not any longer in a rural environment. In India, we will see the same development by 2040 when we have also more than half of the population predicted as living in, in cities. And currently, if we don't manage also to decouple the economic growth from the car ownership, we're having even more problems with also the externalities which comes also with the growth. So here, sustainable transport plays an absolutely vital role. But also we see and saw just recently here in New York, we see Hurricane Sandy, also the potential impact on climate change through extreme weather events. And New York got a lot of attention, but there are lots of other cities and areas who suffer and will suffer more also from these kind of events, and particularly also for the most vulnerable people. This is often the highest, the highest problem. 
And again, also sustainable transport can come up with a solution here. So we, we said we want to look into the big opportunities, how sustainable transport can play a role. Because we have seen also sustainable transport is not a theoretical concept, it can be a reality. It, it's proven it's more cost effective, it's healthier, it's safer, and also it's protect the environment. But particularly also it provides better accessibility. And amongst all these numbers, for me one of the number just more on the local level I would like to highlight is, is Mexico, Mexico City. The average person in Mexico City travel for two hours every day. Two hours. But even more also, the more poor people, and, and we have many cases also, and I would like to tell you one story from one woman actually traveling currently from, for three and a half hours into the city, into the city center. But then also providing here better transport with the bus rapid transit, reducing that by half. What does it mean in terms of quality of life? More, more time also for the family. More time also for, for efficient work. So it's also good for, for, for the employer. So this is really what sustainable transport finally is about, is about the, the, the people. So, when we talk about the three opportunities, we talk about here, about the leadership on the local level and all the potential solution and the solution we have proven. But also this has to be aligned now and this is also unique now where we have the opportunity with national legislation and national policies as well as also with, with international commitment. And we need all three. And in the past we have seen particular the action and the leadership on the ground. I'm really excited also to have tomorrow here the first time the World Bank President, Dr. Kim, will speak, but together with Mayor Bloomberg, one of, of the leaders on sustainable cities and showing actions. And he showed actions where national government on climate change partly failed in, in the US in the past, and we hope all that will change showing also that New York City can become also a city for people. And everybody has in mind now also the picture from Times Square. This is also where people are enjoying the quality of life. And by the way also, this is, is a huge benefit for the, for the retailers. Janet Sadekan just also presented uh, two days at the Sustainable Transport Award. But there are many other good examples. And just to highlight also, we had together our, with our partners from, from ITDP and, and others, the Sustainable Transport Award, where Mexico City won the award for fantastic work also expanding their bus rapid transit, having a holistic plan on sustainable transport, and many, many other things. But for me, the most memorable moment was in fact also having the former mayor, Ebra, who took the leadership and now after the election that the new government is taking over this and saying we want to continue this legacy for the next six years. And this is also important in terms of, of keeping, keeping the governance. So local leadership, local examples are the first big opportunity. But this also needs a framework. And national governments have to act. And we see also that national governments start to act. And there are different, different drivers here. And to give you some examples. One is the climate change law, which was passed by the last Mexican government half, half a year ago. Mexico committed to 30% greenhouse gas emission reduction by, 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 by 2030 and 50% by 2050. But the interesting thing, and that's also new, is sustainable transport is part also of this legislation and also highlighting the need for local, local action. So providing also this framework. And now it's also the time to act. So this is a big opportunity. But also, and we will talk a lot about also the national finance. And we have also 
programs, like in India, the Urban Renewal Program, the first phase five year ended investment of 12 billion and there are lots of lessons to learn and now India said our future is also urban and we as national government have to take actions and reinvesting 40 billion US dollar in the next five years. So the key question is also again how to invest that, 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 that money. Brazil, an, another example, all together with the upcoming Olympics, with the World Cup, to really also live and show uh, sustainable cities, 500 billion are going in a program between 2011 and 2014. But it's not just the money alone. The question is now, also, is there the capacity on the ground? Is there the right institutional setup? Are we having the, 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 the knowledge? And this is also important to highlight that in these programs, put also the money aside. So that's the second. And the third one is also that we have more international commitment and recognition on sustainable transport than, than ever before. We had the conference in Rio Plus 20, which was in general not seen as a large success, but it was the first time also that sustainable transport got really in the media and got really the attention. Yeah, recognition in the text of Rio, well, this is also important for the future. But particularly what stood out was that the eight multilateral development banks committed to more sustainable transport and in, want to invest 175 billion US dollars in the next in the next 10 years. But they can't do it on their own. This is also the responsibility to work together with national governments and also with cities. And there are lots of questions now to raise and lots of questions particularly also to answer. And we will start, start, start here. So how this will leverage also private investment. Can we widen this to the national banks? How can we also set up institutions which can also help to, to invest, invest that money. But also looking into the architecture of the finance and international finance in the future with upcoming more climate investment. Is there a way, is there a potential to, to blend it? Is there a way also to look into a, a sustainable transport uh, facility or a specific sustainable transport window where, where different funds are also going, going together. So many questions also we will have uh, this morning particular on the panel and I'm really excited about that. So under this framework of the three big opportunities on local, national and international, we have a lot of exciting sessions to see also on the local level, like also in the tradition of transforming transportation, to also put up new topics where we currently don't have the answers. This afternoon we will discuss also the role of the informal sector, where there are lots of jobs, but there is not high qualitative jobs, not with a good service, but how, how, we, how we deal with that. What are we doing also with motorcycles? But also to tackle and discuss and showcase urban planning because this is so vital because how the cities will grow will heavily influence also how the people will travel in, in the future. And final word on the local and we heard before also from Jose Luis the importance also of road safety. What is the role of cities? Cities are currently not at the table at the decade of, 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 of action. Can we have also a C40 for road safety for cities to commit also mayors to pay more attention to also this, this important issue and sustainable transport can certainly play a large role to save lives here in the future. And I'm really pleased that we this time also have specific sessions on India, China and Latin America to really discuss in depth with our guest, 
how to learn the lesson from other countries, but also learn and hear more about what happened in the country and take these good examples also to the rest of the world. And I think this is also the spirit of transforming transportation. So with that, I would like uh, to end the speech, would like again to thank the hosts, the partners, the speakers, but particularly also the rest of you who really also can and hopefully will make this conference a success, but more important, make sustainable transport the right future. With that, I'd like to thank you. Have a good event. Thank you, Holger. Before we start our plenary for the morning, I just want to make another uh, announcement about a housekeeping announcement. As you know, there's uh, headsets on your seats for simultaneous translation. Again, channel one for English, channel three for Spanish, channel five for Russian. So for our plenary session this morning, we're pleased to have six distinguished experts and officials to discuss how to transform cities with transport. I'd like to invite June Aid Ahmed, the Middle East and North, North Africa Region Director at the World Bank, to open the session and introduce our panelists. Thank you. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. All right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I've been asked uh, to do something quite impossible, is to have a dialogue with all of you. Now, I don't know how to conduct a dialogue with such a huge crowd, but we'll try. Uh, and we have an extraordinary panel with us. And I think uh, the more we're able to interact with the panel, the more I think we'll get uh, a real sense of this session and a sense of, uh, of the next couple of days. I almost thought that Jose Luis had exactly done the right thing, was to bring a snowstorm at the beginning so we'd see the connection between transport bottlenecks and what cities can do, but it seems he's reserved it for uh, later on today, so we'll, we'll see. But let me quickly uh, introduce the, uh, the panel. The panel is both uh, extraordinary from the technical perspective, but also who they represent. Um, and, and all of you uh, know them, so I'll be very quick. If I could invite uh, uh, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Augusto Guarderas, Mayor of Quito. Please, if I could ask you, John. Not only does he uh, hold the uh, challenging position of mayor, he's also a doctor of, a surgeon, if I'm not wrong, a uh, doctor of medicine. It seems these days development institutions are being led by uh, doctors of medicine. Uh, so uh, perhaps, uh, or perhaps I should have taken a different route to uh, arrive in development a long time ago. Uh, Next, I'd like to introduce uh, 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 Dr. Nikolai Asaul. I hope I pronounced the name right. Uh, our, uh, <laughs> Deputy Minister of Transport of the Russian Federation. And what's extraordinary is in, in all of the wonderful things he has done, he has won an interesting state award, the title of which is Honorary Builder of Russia. Now that's a, quite, a, quite a challenging uh, title to hold. If I could now introduce uh, uh, Mr. Fotis uh, Karami uh, Karamitsos, Deputy Director General, Mobility and Transport, European Commission. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Who not only brings the perspectives of the European, uh, uh, European Commission, but is a civil engineer and a transport planner uh, by, uh, uh, by training. Um, my pleasure to introduce to all of you uh, Dr. Rohit uh, Agarwal. Rohit, please join us. <laughs> Rohit is a special advisor to uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who's the chairman of the C40 Cities uh, Climate Leadership Group. So we're going to see some interesting perspective from him in the, in the connection between cities, transport, and climate change. And then uh, it's my uh, special privilege to uh, introduce to you Dr. Rakesh Mohan, uh, who is uh, India's executive director uh, in, the, in the IMF. Uh, Rakesh, wonderful to see you. Uh, 
those of you who do not know this, Rakesh, uh, in, in, in the many things he has done, uh, is probably one of the key thinkers about city governance, metropolitan governance uh, that, uh, uh, that I've actually encountered. And he doesn't know this, that my entry into urban economics was a result of reading his books on Bogota many, many years ago. So I welcome, uh, welcome this, uh, this panel. Um, I want to do something slightly different. Um, I would like just a smattering from, this is an extraordinary panel. All of you come from background of cities and transport. Can you just get up and say one question, one point that you would like them to address at least during the conversation? Can I hear what, 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 what you are thinking about when you think about cities and transport? There's a, there's a mic here, just, just a few of you, just quickly. What is it? Is it traffic jams? Uh, is it uh, institutions? Is it politics? What, what bothers you when you think about cities and, uh, uh, and uh, transportation? Please. Thank you. Just in two words, the quality of life in the cities, and we can create it by more cycling. So what is the position of cycling in your policies? Okay, so non-motorized uh, vehicle, big issue, uh, big issue in your mind. What, what else? What? Uh, I'm uh, Elena de Gunji from the University of Amsterdam. I'm very interested in what their visions are on using new forms of data and big data and how they can harness uh, data for improving the management and operations of systems in their um, areas. Okay, is, is, is data going to be a big problem? Now, these are just, just to see what, what the crowd is thinking and, and I'm going to ask you to reflect from your perspective, but keep these in mind, please. Hi, Bob Praviti from First Environment. One question that I have that I experienced in Mexico City, um, the role of politics here, when we're trying to transform how uh, small crowded entities control certain pieces of the narrative so that it makes it difficult for good ideas to kind of percolate and grow. Politics, the world of political economy. Please. Uh, Brian Respecki, Social Bicycles. Are there different tools that need to be applied for cities in the developing world, some of these uh, massive mega cities that are emerging? Um, what can we learn from, from kind of the, the developed nations and what applies and what doesn't apply? Big cities emerging in developing countries. Are there lessons from developed countries uh, to, to share? Sir. Yeah, John Wetmore, pedestrians.org. Uh, is walking even recognized as a form of transportation by your DOT? Oh. Is walking recognized? Some of us, uh, some of us who are getting of that age, you should do a little more walking and recognize it clearly, please. And Rafael Acevedo from the IDB. Um, one of the questions that I have is, um, what is the role of public involvement in making sure that there is continuity in in the policies from one administration to the next? Role of participation. Uh, Marie von Glissy Fressard, MPF Consult, ex World Bank. Preparedness. Preparedness in the moment of uncertainty with climate change, technological changes, financial uncertainties, and uh, new uh, social expectations. This is this is a this is a, a an incredible question. I, when I started working in uh, Mena, the first thing I realized that uh, Jeddah had flooded twice two years in a row. And as a Bangladeshi, I'm used to floods in cities, but I had not thought of Jeddah flooding as being an important. So shocks into cities and how transport uh, adjusts, I think, is a, is, a, is a big issue. So the last two. Uh, my name is, is Hiroaki Suzuki. I'm from Abanka. Two things which bother me is sector silo mentality behavior, both in our client, in our institution. And second, very often, uh, Transforming transportation or transforming city. Transportation for me is a mean to transform city rather than end objective. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Uh, sector silos is a very important uh, uh, challenge. Uh, I lead the sustainable development department, which is made up of six or seven uh, uh, sub uh, units. Getting them to talk in one go around sustainable development is tough. I wonder how a mayor of a, of a city actually gets different parts of a, of a city to talk to each other. Final. I'm Michael Replogel with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. 
Today, people regard traffic congestion, air pollution, traffic fatalities, and things like that like they regard the weather. We can't do anything about it. We have to suffer it. How can we transform surface transportation into something that operates more like a regulated public utility where we can focus on operating the system for performance and take politics out of decisions about spending on capital side and have chaos on the operating side. Okay, was, was that gonna be the final question? Hi, yes. Inyala Kuzan from Next Energy. We're a technology accelerator in Detroit. And the question I have is, what are some ways to engage the private sector, and particularly in entrepreneurs and inventors who have really great new service models and technologies that are transformative, but don't necessarily understand where they fit into the city planning, what the business case is, or even who their customer might be. So you see there's a, there's a whole range of questions from politics, institutions, uh, technology, climate change, data, all around this connection between cities and, and transport. Um, you know, when I, I discovered cities and transport in 1992 when I first started working on South Africa. South Africa, uh, under apartheid, as uh, uh, most of you will know, uh, divided its cities into cities for white communities and cities for black communities. What was interesting is these cities were meant for only the white community. As a result of urbanization, you had the inflow of the black community into cities for work, but, they did not, but the uh, apartheid policies never let the black community, the majority, enter the cities they were placed in townships around the major cities. Uh, so the first issue that came up was how urbanization was actually undoing apartheid policies, but the structure of the city was those who had come to work were placed at least 40, 50 minutes away from the cities. What emerged was an incredible taxi industry connecting the townships with the cities, and that was the life of South African cities. Now, you move forward into democracy, and for years now, the South Africans have been trying to undo the spatial uh, distribution of the cities, bring the cities together, and they're trying to change the transport sector from these unregulated combi taxis that link the cities to now far more formal systems of transportation. And what they've discovered is the politics and institutions of undoing the past is extremely difficult. I think what we want out of this uh, the session today and, and this panel is to understand the connection between urbanization, which is the big force in the world today, and how transport can make cities actually deliver its economic, social, and, uh, uh, and political promises. Uh, so I think when we leave this room, at least some questions should be in the minds, all, on all our minds as the next two days unfolds. So let me start with, uh, with Rakesh, if, uh, if Rakesh will uh, permit me. Uh, Rakesh, you are, are recently been, uh, started uh, as the chair of, I think, a National Transport Commission uh, in India. Uh, India's big city, Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, name it, big metropolitan cities. Can you give us a sense of what are the challenges that these cities are facing in terms of transport uh, and what are some of the thinking of, of the Indian government of how to tackle, uh, uh, tackle this challenge? I'm going to ask you all to be quick in your response because I want to keep moving and then I'm going to get the uh, audience to start uh, quizzing you. Please, Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you, Junaid, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, you would wonder uh, why the executive director of the IMF is interested in transport, and the answer is what Junaid just said. Not recently, actually, we've been working on this National Transport Policy Committee for a little over two and a half years, actually. Um, let me answer your question somewhat indirectly, that um, as was mentioned uh, in the inaugural uh, comments, um, countries like ours are urbanizing fast. And so today we have 50 cities over a million people. We'll have about more than 80 probably in 20 years' time. And maybe we have three cities above 10 million, and there'll probably be at least six, if not more, in 20 years' time. I only, make this, only mention this in relation to your question that it's not just the issue of the largest cities. And one of the problems I see is 
that in looking at urban transport planning, we are mesmerized by the problems of the largest cities, ignoring everything else. And so I think that's a big issue. Um, in the questions that were raised by the audience, um, there were concerns to do with walking, cycling, safety. No one mentioned fast transport, right? But I think if you, and in any, any transport specialists conference, I see that, that people are concerned with safety, frequency, walking, cycling, etc. But I think if you look at India, China, almost any country, see what they actually do is the opposite of what any transport specialist conference like this talk about. I think that's a real question we have to ask. So, for example, in Bombay, Delhi, so I should say Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, that Bangalore, Hyderabad, the biggest accent is making vehicle transport speeds faster. Whether it is putting in a metro, whether it is putting in highways, whether it is put, uh, sort of removing traffic lights from, from roads. Uh, when you go to any conference, everyone says the opposite. So my question actually as a non-transport expert is to all of you, is why this disconnect? That we always talk about these good things in life, but we always do the opposite. Analyze the expenditure pattern, analyze the World Bank investments in urban transport, and see where have they, have they been investing in metros, in BRTs, in highways, or have they been investing in cycling tracks, walking tracks, uh, and so for other things with sustainable transport. So I'm giving you a very indirect non-answer because this is something that puzzles me and I would like to learn more from this audience on that. Fair enough, fair enough. We'll, we'll, the issue of smaller towns, the issue of actually a transport system must get people to move quickly to where they want to go. I want to come back to this issue of why, why that is not happening. Well, if, if I can just, it's not just smaller cities, even the bigger cities, if you look, there's very little data actually in terms of most of our bigger cities in developing countries, certainly in India, of what do people actually do? There's excessive concern with the commuting work trip, which is why this concern with excessive speed, when in fact, people never talk about, after all, almost every, hopefully every child goes to school in the morning, comes back in the afternoon. Thousands, millions of students, right? Also, people going shopping in the day, leisure, everything else. There's very little analysis of all of these trips. The concentration is on the commuting trip in the morning, commuting trip in the back, and we then invest in metros and highways and BRTs and so on, trying to make that faster. You then increase the sprawl of the city and actually then make it very difficult for everyone else to do what they do during the day. And of course, safety issues. These days, as I'm commuting, unfortunately, somewhat long distance temporarily while I settle down in Washington, and I hear the, uh, and I hear the um, uh, radio in the morning, what I find is there are at least three to four to five crashes every day in the Washington metropolitan area, all of them in highways, all of them in highways. None of them, as I see hear the radio, none of them on normal streets which have traffic lights and slower speeds. And therefore, this issue of getting people there faster, I think, is an issue. And people look at vehicle speeds, not door-to-door -door times, or what people, actually, what people actually do in terms of travel. Okay, so let's, let's move to Europe, if, uh, if we can. Uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, where is the debate about integrated land planning and uh, urban transport in European cities? What are, would you say are some of the key challenges European cities are facing? And then want to uh, piggyback on the question that came. Any lessons uh, uh, that this offers to countries like India or, or Bangladesh or, uh, uh, or Morocco? First of all, thanks for this invitation. Just to mention a couple of important figures, I think, here, because maybe people don't realize immediately that in Europe, more or less, two-thirds of our population live in urban areas. And the other important dimension is that 85% of our GDP is created in urban areas. So the economic sustainability of our, the, the, of our economy, let's say, the sustainability depends very much on a livable environment in our cities. And cities are not the same. They have different categories. Uh, what we do, we did some programs, for example, for bringing them together. 
We have a program, for example, where 60 cities, they have started working. We have devoted a number of resources, let's say, to identify common elements that they can exchange good practice, exchange information, and implement, let's say, learn the one from the other. And there you can categorize, let's say, again, the big metropolitan areas, London, Paris, where actually lessons learned certainly can be used as well for the third world. And then you have the medium side of cities, which is the biggest, the biggest part in Europe, which also th this exchange of information, practical elements and so forth helps very much the economic development. Now, from, from our side, uh, let's say, in the European Commission, certainly our role is not to create a top-down approach, more or less is to, to facilitate this exchange of best practice, get the people together, uh, create a framework where they can learn from each other, and then, of course, we have this framework I call, we call Civitas program, on which actually we very much invite uh, cities from third countries to participate as well. So I think this is some of the elements that, uh, that we have there, and certainly from our experience, uh, we try, let's say, three or four parts to advise. So first of all, uh, let's say somebody mentioned down there how you get the private sector involved, uh, how we can get the private sector. We have found out that if you make these nodes of transport, the terminals, very attractive for business as well. It's not only that you bring the public transport and the interconnection of the various modes, but at the same time you have business to come in, to develop them, to finance them, and then of course this is the private sector coming in and facilitates very much this partnership between the private and the public sector. The other thing is what we have done on the, on the side of the overall transport policy. We try to develop high density corridors on which, let's say, in that respect, you can concentrate your resources, you can make your public transport much more efficient, and you can help very much, let's say, your investment planning on that. Another issue which uh, we found out through this cooperation between the various cities is we have uh, seen that uh, people, and maybe the Dutch uh, example is a, very, is a very good one, but other places as well, compact cities. People are trying, let's say, to develop uh, more uh, these cities where walking, and cycling is important. Uh, just to mention that uh, the average movement in European cities, this is about two to three kilometers. So really most of it can be done if we design our system in a way that we have straight access. And then finally, let's say, the big question which is we have all of us, I think, it's this urban scroll. How, how you can really address this issue, this expansion, 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 without any proper urban planning, and particularly the issue of the administration. You have different local authorities with different responsibilities and they don't want to talk to each other. So we have to try to bring in these big agglomerations, in particular the local authorities, to have a common planning on this. And this is quite a challenge, I think. With that, I think I would like to stop. Thank you. Um, if I could, uh, uh, could move to uh, the mayor. Uh, uh, one of the points that has come out is planning at the local level. Uh, and with it, the challenge of how do you create more integrated planning at a more larger metropolitan level. The reason I'm raising this question is there's often a question that perhaps transport planning should not be given to cities to do, uh, but rather should be done by, an, by a provincial government or even by a central government, because there's a need to actually create uh, uh, planning between, between towns, between agglomerations. How is uh, the issue of transport planning done in Quito? What lessons do you, do you bring out? Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación. Voy a hablar en español. First of all, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm going to be speaking Spanish. It's impossible to successfully grapple with mobility of people in our societies if we don't do it in a comprehensive fashion. It's absolutely impossible. Mobility of people has to do with quality of life, planning of land use, the citizenry. It has to do with many different dimensions. And that's why, for us, the discussion of mobility is the discussion of the future of our cities. Not only are we talking about a technical component, a specific component, it's more the dimension of our cities. And cities are now the place where most people live in Latin America and in the rest of the world. So this is a tremendously important discussion. It has to do with civilization itself. 
in our city, and I'm talking about Quito, but the same would apply to the rest of Latin America. During recent years, we have seen that the use of automobiles has shot up tremendously. In Quito, we are growing more than 2 percent per year in terms of number of inhabitants, but the number of vehicles is going up by 8 percent a year. So, of course, this is unsustainable in the long term. It's unsustainable for a city to have to deal with 100,000, 200,000 cars more every year because that means that every effort to increase road capacity means focusing all resources without probably even being able to solve the problems. So that's why we have a different vision in this connection. We are convinced that we need very strong public authority so as to regulate the growth of cities. And we have the idea of a compact, densified city. We do not share the idea of sprawl, of extension of the urban space. We think that we need well-defined dimensions for our cities and that we have to improve cities' uh, services. That's why planning the transport system goes hand in hand with planning land use. We think that that is absolutely essential. We have to link planning of the use of land with transport planning. And secondly, we're convinced that the solution is to strengthen public transportation systems. We feel that for a very long time, as our colleague here was saying, a lot was talked about alternative means of mobility, but most of our resources went to building roads. So what was discussed in uh, fora was basically to make us all feel better, and then we would go home and build more freeways and more roads. So we think that most investment has to go into improving public transportation, having good quality public transport. That is what we are seeking. We have an integrated system that we're going to talk about tomorrow. We have BRTs uh, and transport corridors. And we think that we have to grapple with administrative issues too. Fragmentation, atomizing, uh, decision making is bad for cities. We are a metropolitan area of about 4,000 square kilometers and we are the sole transportation authority because we think that fragmenting does weaken. And this has a lot to do with culture, too. We do think of walking, and we encourage non-motorized transportation. We are working on our sidewalks, parks. We're trying to get people to walk. And it's not logical for people to take a car to move 500 or 600 meters. It takes them longer to get into the car and get out of it and then look for a parking place. It's much faster to walk. So we have to also change the culture, the mindset. And there's no better mobility than mobility avoided. So the idea is to make sure that the services are close to the population. We have decentralized schools, hospitals, to take those services close to the population. And so in a few words, that is our approach. From a city base, I'd like you to uh, interrogate uh, uh, with the uh, with the mayor, let me let me turn to Rohit. Uh, uh, Rohit, uh, share with us a little bit uh, what C40 is doing uh, in terms of this dialogue on transportation and cities. Uh, what what lessons are you hearing from the dialogue in C40 uh, about the the connection between cities and transport? Sure, thank you, and and also thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy today, as as Holger alluded to. Uh, that, that Embark and C40 are, are deepening our cooperation with a formal MOU, and I, I think it speaks to the extent to which C40, which although we've kept the number in our name, now includes 63 cities around the world, 8% um, of the world's population, 21% of the world's GDP. Uh, we are a membership organization of our, of our mayors, and our mayors tell us what they are working on and what they want to work on. And increasingly, we see more and more interest in transportation broadly defined and including, and I think the a couple of the things the, 
the audience mentioned, the focus on walking, the focus on cycling, these are things that not only increasingly do mayors, such as, as our mayor here uh, pointed out, want, but what's particularly exciting, and you alluded to this a moment ago, is that mayors almost universally have control over streets. Right? Transportation on the surface is something that mayors and city councils, generally speaking, have direct control over, and therefore they can move quickly. That is less so when you're talking about heavy rail, which is already often done at the provincial level, although st still more than half is mayors, but nonetheless it's less, and very little at the highway level. And I think this may be one of the challenges that highways, even those highways that go into center cities, are almost never decided by the mayors. And so, uh, so what's exciting for us is we see the demand to work on these things, and C40 is going to be moving to work with our partners like Embark and IDTV and others to help our cities work together at that, that implementing official level, because what we really want to do is connect the person who every day goes to work knowing they've got to implement the bike share, or they've got to do the pedestrian plaza, or they've got to get the BRT system done with that person's counterpart in a city with similar powers, similar challenges, but that they might not know because it's not the next city over. But what we see is that there are a lot of lessons that can be exchanged uh, among cities that you wouldn't necessarily put together, mm. right? Everybody might say, well, New York and London, yeah, there's a lot of similarity there. Tokyo and Seoul, yeah, maybe there's a lot to learn uh, between those two. But we need to be thinking more about the counterintuitive pairings because we find those to be fruitful and we find the most exciting ideas to come out of those. And I think nothing speaks more to the fact that some of those ideas move in counterintuitive directions than the fact that bus rapid transit is a south to north innovation, right? This is not something that the developed world figured out and, and has exported, it's gone the other way. And I think that's also the wave of the future. It's a very interesting point you raise. Uh, what I discovered the more I uh, worked on cities is that the exchange between cities, north, south, south, north, east, west, is far deeper than exchange between nation states and that the lessons are being learned in, in both, uh, both directions. But the other point that I think uh, is something that I'd like to explore with the, with the audience is, to what extent is this hypothesis of, if you don't empower mayors to actually deal with transport, you will not deal with the problems of urban transport. That a lot of the problems that we see in many of the countries we work on is that these decisions of land and transport are often done separately and done by different tiers of government. Could I, could I just on that topic, I think one of the things, and, and uh, uh, you mentioned it as well, um, and a couple of the, the audience members asked about the politicization, right? The, the fact is that streets are the most contested space in any city. Right? It's the thing we can't avoid using. You don't have to use the park. You don't have to use the airport. You have no choice in your daily life but to use the streets. Inevitably, that will make them contested. That was true 200 years ago before the automobile was invented. It will be true 200 years from now when we have stuff we don't even know about. It's shared. It will therefore be contested and therefore politicized. What I find really remarkable is that the level of government and the geographic expanse of government at which transportation authority rests, I think is actually less important than whether that aligns with what the public thinks is responsible for it. And I would contrast New York and London on this score. The mayor of London under the new last uh, 15 years or so regime has control over transport for London and most of the arterial streets and both mayors now under that regime have done phenomenal things with London transport. In New York, so the subway system and the transit system have actually been state responsibilities for 60 years. And today, still, if you do an opinion poll, the average New Yorker thinks the mayor runs the subways and blames him when things go wrong. And the problem, therefore, is that the person who has the power to fix it doesn't have the need to fix it, and the person who would, would be willing to do what the public wants actually can't. That's the alignment that has to work. Fascinating, fascinating. I think a lot of policy implications from that statement. Before we continue this conversation, could I ask uh, 
uh, uh, Dr. Assal to, jo uh, to join the conversation. Tell us a little bit about Russian cities and the transport challenge that uh, Russian cities are facing. Uh, I, I unfortunately have not had the uh, honor of working in, uh, uh, in that part of the world, so I'm not familiar. So if you could just introduce Russia's uh, cities and transport challenges, I would like to contrast it from some of the conversations that have started. Спасибо большое за возможность выступить на этой конференции. Мы с Мировым банком работаем достаточно давно. Начинали с структурирования крупных проектов развития аэропортов, скоростных магистралей. И вот в этом году перешли к развитию, комплексному развитию городских транспортных систем. Tenemos todo un historial. Транспорта и... Uh, the update of the uh, transportation hardware and the introduction of uh, smart transport systems. The degree of urbanization in Russia is quite high. It's comparable to the U.S. 74% of Russians live in uh, urban areas, and it is exactly in uh, the cities that the population has not dropped over the last few years. But on the contrary, the population in the cities has been increasing. The problems are hardly unique. They're uh, about the same as those uh, faced around the world. Uh, a colleague of mine has uh, said that the automobiles uh, grow faster than the population. Uh, the same is uh, true in uh, Russian cities, where uh, uh, the car population grows uh, at 2.5, 2.7 percent a year, whereas the population only grows by 1 percent a year. We understand that we can't catch up uh, with the growth of uh, the car population. So we're focusing on alternative transportation, such as um, uh, walking. Uh, cycling, unfortunately, uh, due, mostly due to uh, climatic reasons. Uh, much of the time uh, in winter, uh, it snows and it's too cold. We see cycling mostly as a tourist entertainment mode of transportation, um, and uh, we're not placing a focus. Uh, so we are focusing on uh, uh, public transportation. Uh, we have metros in uh, eight cities, and uh, they're quite ramified uh, metro systems. Uh, Moscow's metro is the world's third as far as intensity of uh, movement, and uh, we are uh, planning to build metros in other cities as well. Uh, the uh, metro, the underground uh, systems, are the responsibility of cities, not of the federal center. And uh, this year we have uh, made proposals so that uh, assistance can be given to the construction of the metro systems and so that uh, private business can be involved, especially where uh, we can uh, use the metro on the surface rather than uh, make it uh, true underground uh, because it would be cheaper. Uh, in uh, Russia, the metro uh, oftentimes is a work of art where gigantic investments used to go into the construction of uh, metro. Now we see it increasingly more often as a transportation, uh, not you know a uh, museum piece. And uh, the involvement of the federal center is more important where major cities such as Moscow and St. Petersburg, which while they are limited within their um, geographical uh, footprint, they realize that uh, in addition to streamlining and improving the transportation within themselves, they need to uh, build so-called intercepting parking lots at the approaches to the cities. And we have now established an entity uh, whose mandate is to interlink the uh, development of transportation uh, systems uh, and create incentives for individuals to switch from private transport to public transport if only halfway through their journey so that they can leave their cars at the approaches to the center or the city and uh, switch to public transport. We are uh, uh, going to encourage this uh, via uh, paid parking. It certainly will be an incentive, and we have started doing it in a number of uh, cities. We uh, also believe that uh, 
cities should be, urban planning should be such so that uh, people's uh, commutes will be uh, not quite as long as they used to be and preferably the shorter the better so that uh, they will be physically closer, uh, so that the places of work will be physically closer to the places where they shop and where they live. So that's uh, another focus of ours. Thank you. And, and one as a, a minister in, in a federal system. Uh, we hear a lot about compact cities and sprawl cities. Uh, but most cities inherit history. They become sprawled or they become compact. To what extent do you believe that public policy can actually change the uh, spatial structure of, of cities? And I asked this question, I went back to South Africa after uh, almost 15 years, and I can tell you that the apartheid structures of the cities remain what they are. That even after so many years, they have not been able to change the spatial structure. So can I hear very quickly from, from the mayor and then, then from you as, as minister, do we really have public policy tools to change the spatial structure of cities, please? Um, yes, and it's not an easy or short-term process. It's unthinkable that a product or something as complex as a city really can't be shaped in the short term. That's impossible. But I am convinced that we definitely can set a public policy that would establish a clear-cut trend. We do have some tools, especially in the case of Latin America, where we have similar legislation. We, for example, define on what the perimeters of a city is going to be. And that is legal statute. We define what the limits of cities are to be. And in that way, that limit has to be upheld. In the case of Quito, we have been very stringent, making certain that the city limits are not modified. That means that it's prohibited, or at least very costly, to build outside of that perimeter. So that limits the sprawl of cities. Because without that, the social cost of spread is tremendous. Every time that you build a neighborhood out of the city, and that can be either high or low income, the municipality, the state has to build another school, public transportation, security, a police station, water, sewage. All of that has to be built out to that city. And often within the urban perimeter, we have empty land. And so that's a paradox. We're now trying to promote densification and construction within the urban perimeter. So that's tremendously important. That's something we can do. It's not something you're going to see the results of immediately, but there are tools that allow us to encourage densification of our cities. For example, building up in Latin America, most of our cities have one or two story houses, sometimes one story only, especially in low-income houses. So we can densify, we can build up. And then second, we have to think about the quality of this land. In the case of Quito, for example, most universities, most schools were located in the urban uh, center, but the city was growing from the outskirts. So anyone going to the university, to the hospital, to school, would have to commute an hour and a half to get there. So we need to decentralize these services, taking them closer to growing areas. So on one hand, we have to control the urban perimeter, and then we have to decrease our commutes by taking services to the population. Something we see in many cities is that there's a great inequality between rich and poor areas within the same city. So that's why it's important to decentralize hospitals, for example, and improve the quality of our land use. These are things we can definitely do. And I think it's important to have a metropolitan scale. If municipalities are very small, they're weak. And if you get larger settlements, the best thing is 
and that's a case of Bogota, San Salvador, Mexico, DF. They do have tools, so they can be mayor's offices, but at a metropolitan level. If you're a smaller city, it's harder to manage surrounding land. принимать собственное решение. Это действительно общее мнение, что города не должны расширяться, но вот у нас с Москвой произошло opposite. Uh, last year alone, uh, Moscow's uh, territory was effectively doubled, which has to do with the fact that Moscow is an extremely uh, um, centralized uh, location, uh, which uh, houses both a financial hub, a uh, governmental hub, a cultural hub. There's a lot of uh, migration. People are coming and moving into Moscow. So the older Moscow, up until last year, physically was unable to contain everybody, and it, uh, its territory was doubled. Unfortunately, uh, at the time when uh, we did urban planning, in the USSR, uh, the idea was uh, to have potentially 150 roughly cars per thousand population. The number has since exceeded 300 cars per thousand population. And uh, in the historical downtown, such as in St. Petersburg, we can no longer build highways. Uh, we can no longer build roundabouts. People don't want to live in high-rises that stand too close to one another where there is a shortage of light, where there isn't enough vegetation. We understand that it is a very expensive thing to have sprawl, but it is still a possibility if you use light rail and uh, other public transportation. And uh, in a number of cities where there is a demand for that and where there are resources, we do allow sprawl. and. We, uh, to avoid Moscow from completely exploding, have been removing a number of uh, functions, governmental functions, from Moscow. We have moved the Constitutional Court uh, from Moscow to St. Petersburg. The uh, High Arbitration Court uh, will uh, shortly move to St. Petersburg, and other government functions will be moved away from Moscow. And in that sense, we are trying to uh, pacify Moscow's uh, sprawl. But uh, in, 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 in other cities, we are tolerating it. Can I bring another experience a little bit on this governance question we mentioned? The role of the local, national, and super, let's say, national uh, role. Uh, our experience has been that the cities want, from different member states, to come and discuss together common problems. And very often, they prefer this type of discussion that having this top-down from the national government to tell them what to do because they say they don't know our problems. We have common problems between London and uh, Paris, and I don't want to hear, let's say, the central government to tell me what I have to do. As a result, let's say, uh, the, they look also to the European community, let's say, the European Union, what it can help. So what we have done, we brought them together. 200 of them now, they have committed themselves to work out on sustainable urban mobility plans. And conditional is now that if there is money to come from the regional fund or whatever, from the community budget, this goes to the city that has developed such a plan. So there is a motivation for people to come together and work commonalities. So there is a strategic planning, a guidance document that has been developed. You can find it in the mobilityplans.eu that we have put it in the website. Cities that they have developed it, it's okay, it's not the commission that has developed it, but it is the cities together, okay, we facilitated this process, they have developed this plan, and then now the next stage is, okay, this is the EU money, but at the same time, it facilitates themselves, turning towards the national government and said, why the EU gives me money to do this like rail transit system, and I want money from you as well. So the, the, the whole thing, I think it's facilitated by bringing the local level more closer together, Having this common plan, and then people can, we can incentivize, let's say, bringing together by having the money thing as well. So it's an experience that maybe 
people can share from, from the rest. And I said that 200 cities is not a small number that they have come together and they have committed themselves to develop such plans. Actually, we're seeing quite a bit of this in many countries where central government or a state government provides an incentive for a city against a mobility plan as opposed to specific projects. And then you see the emergence of a very different city structure and city, uh, city programs. I'm going to ask Rakesh a question, but could I ask uh, colleagues to, uh, uh, if they want to ask questions, to just stand up. Uh, Rakesh, this issue about different tiers of government as one institutional issue. Uh, so when I look at India, uh, I've, I've given up on the 73rd and 74th Amendment. Uh, the politics seems to be too difficult. Can, can one think of it differently? Can one think of instead of uh, different tiers of government, but the notion of uh, transport authorities, transport utilities, so you create a utility structure rather than an intergovernmental structure, sort of like the New York uh, uh, City Authority, Transport Authority. Is that a model that could move us towards better managed and integrated managed public, uh, uh, public uh, transport systems? Um, this really is, I think, the most uh, vexing question uh, in India uh, for the next 20, 30 years. As I mentioned right at the beginning, given the number of large cities we're going to have, the possibility of either the central government, the national government, or state governments being able to cope with the different kinds of needs of different cities, I think is very low. So I would say that we really have no choice for the future to really act on the 73rd and 74th Amendments to the Constitution, which uh, most of you wouldn't know, but basically to do with empowerment of city governments. Um, I agree with you that there hasn't really been any movement in that direction at all, but I really don't see an alternative. And I think that's why I was fascinated to listen to the mayors here, that it is of the utmost importance to my mind that both for urban, for urban planning itself, uh, urban structure, governance of cities, and of course for urban transportation planning, that it has to be localized. Um, Second, that what this also implies is that we really have to spend a great deal of resources and attention to development of capacity, which means both research and development, which means training of planners, training of transportation planners, etc., who actually then understand the needs of a particular city and act accordingly. Um, third, that another theme that has come through is this uh, huge increase in personalized transport, whether it is cars, whether it is motorbikes, etc. There I do feel that we need to accept that there is an incredible aspirational issue here. That's right. That uh, those people who are just getting into income levels where they can afford uh, personalized transport are going to have it. And I think that we as transportation planners, experts, thinkers, have to accept that and then think of how, how to do demand management. And I think one issue there is to make sure that we make people pay fully for the externalities that they cause, which means proper pricing of fuel, proper taxation of cars, proper pricing of parking. I mean, most of us, almost every city in the world, except for some parts of cities, think it a birthright that you, must, you should be able to park free on public property. We object if a poor person sets up a shack on public property. I said, how can you do that on public property? But we think it's a birthright to park our cars free on public property. So I think that many of these kind of issues, do, some of them were alluded to by the mayor, sort of demand management, so that you, un, you, you accept that people will have the aspiration of owning a personalized transport, but then, do act, but then make them pay for it. Fourth, that we also, that in terms of public transport, which was mentioned, that we need to think there are many different kinds of public transport. One of the issues that has arisen is that we think of public transport only as metros, BRTs, and public buses. When in fact, if you look at the reality, um, in developing country cities in particular, almost every, most people actually use public transport, but they will not be organized systems, the kind of public transport you mentioned in the beginning, shared vans, uh, shared uh, uh, small buses, shared taxis, etc. And one of the points of importance there is that, as was mentioned, 
that if you have a high density corridor, you can clearly have large capacity buses, high capacity BRTs, etc. But most of them, most corridors are not high capacity uh, uh, corridors. And for, to, to wean people away from personalized transport, you've got to make sure that you can walk out of your house or office and get transport within five to 10 minutes. And what that means is if it's not high capacity corridor, you need to have smaller vans or smaller buses, et cetera. And in fact, if you observe what actually diff has emerged in different cities in the world, you have that mix of transport, except that transport planners, transport experts refuse to recognize that. Uh, except in theoretical discussions like this, um, and don't actually provide or make it convenient for those modes of public transport to actually operate, which people like and use. So I think these are some of the issues that we need to be thinking for, particularly from our countries, where the, the, some issues are different. But one question of the audience was, what is different about developing country cities? One difference is that you have many different income levels operating at the same time. Second difference is we are growing fast. So that uh, over the next 20 years, you'll have so many more cities, every city will grow bigger in size, etc. And we don't really know what kind of technologies will emerge, we don't know what kind of fuel prices, energy prices will emerge, etc. And therefore, it's up to utmost importance that we build capacities to deal with these changes. Anything you predict today is bound to be wrong 10 years from now. We must recognize that. And therefore, the, uh, the comes back to your basic question, therefore you have to build capacity at the city level to be able to cope with changes as they take place. Okay, let's uh, draw in our colleagues, please. Hi, my name is Kavi Bhala from Johns Hopkins University. I have a question for Dr. Rakesh Mohan. So Dr. Mohan asked us why is it that governments do the exact opposite of what people in this room recommend? <laughs> And I think the answer to that question is probably clear to most of us, and that is that governments and all public policy is run by economists, <laughs> and, and e economics, well, even there the are, prime minister, let, let me there finish. Are six, six economists in the government of India. Let <laughs> me finish. Even the prime minister of India is an economist. <laughs> He's one of the six. <laughs> My question is to you, and that is that I believe that economics as an institution cannot think beyond money. That's the only reason uh, we prioritize work trips over any other trips, which is the question you are asking. Now, you are an economist. You should tell us why is it that ideas from economics have hegemony in public thinking, and why is it that ideas of health and well-being do not? Okay, thank you. Another question, and we'll, we'll group them. Yeah. Hi, my name is Connie and let, the, sh I, the shorter your questions, the more people will be able to yeah. get it. I'm uh, with the Slow Cut Partnership. My question is to the mayor of Quito, who talked about the, the uh, rapid increase in cars. What does he think of the experience in China, where in the three largest cities, they have now restricted the number of the growth in cars through having vehicle quotas? Huh? Okay, one more. The thing was there, do we have to the tools to reshape the city. In the past, we had the tool, the car, the motorization reshaped our cities. And I'm coming from Europe, from Germany. If you compare to US, you see the differences. The second question I have, do we have the tools to reshape it again to a better urban form? And I think yes, partly yes. Correct pricing, as was mentioned. A better urban form, better urban land use, like decentralized centralization to give people opportunities to live in the neighborhood. And maybe a little bit of public transport, but public transport, there is also a risk that sprawl is continuing. And we need to think to do it the other way around. And I think urban form, centralized, decentralized concentration may help. Thank you. Okay. Shall we, shall we just, since there are just three, let's get My the, name is okay. Pedro Canov. And my question regard the following, we know that the um, more of half of the population of the world live in the cities, and this is a trend who is, we suppose go to continue in the next years. However, what I don't hear is about the distribution of goods for the consume of these people, for the alimentation, for instance, food, or other goods who people need. I participate in a group of reflection uh, in the Ecole of Ingenieurs de Mines Paris. Um, 
Iliam uh, is, there are a big problem for the distribution of goods. I know who in the European Union there are some constraint for the hours in which the trucks will enter in the cities, but uh, we make uh, in the School of Engineering, in that group of research, some hypothesis to use sustainable transportation for the goods using distribution centers in the neighbors. And I would be glad if you could say something about the strategy for the next years, because if not, the problem of the trucks, for instance, in America, who I see, is very serious. Thank you. Quickly, the next two, please. Hi, Colin Hughes from ITDP. Uh, the message of the responsibility and power of mayors over the transport in the cities was very clear, but I'm wondering uh, what do you all think is the most important thing uh, the national government can do to support mayors um, in, in enhancing sustainable transport in cities? Okay. Eric Lancelot, World Bank. Uh, we're talking a lot of uh, planning at the uh, city level, planning either at the, also at the, at, the, at the state or federal or national level. And this needs to be uh, taken into account, obviously. And there is a perspective that uh, is not taken, uh, uh, well, hasn't been discussed uh, yet, is uh, new technologies nowadays allow to uh, um, uh, avoid uh, a lot of uh, tr transport. So uh, uh, having, uh, working in a different manner on avoiding, for, uh, for example, to, to have to commute every day on spending one or two days uh, working from, from home is, is probably something which would contribute to resolve a lot of the problems of congestion, congestions uh, that, uh, that, ex that exist nowadays. So taking the perspective of the, 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 this, this new modality of, of, of work is probably something which needs also to be taken into account in the transport planning. Okay, so uh, I think uh, part of this session is people are raising questions which over the next two days are going to be addressed. Uh, we may not be able to address all of them, and since we are in the last uh, three minutes of, uh, of this session, I'm going to ask you to conclude with, uh, with responses. So I'm going to ask just direct questions. Rohit, I'm going to be begin with you. Can you share with us, when you hear the conversation in the C40, what are people saying as the levers that will, that will shape the future of, of transport in, in cities? Uh, if you could think about that. If I could ask the mayor, what is the one thing that you think national government uh, ought to be uh, uh, ought to be doing in terms of uh, uh, shaping the uh, the story of, of cities. Uh, Rakesh, uh, you have to answer this question about is economic determinism the uh, uh, the driving uh, uh, driving force of why we failed to uh, to clear the cities. And I'll leave uh, each of you to reflect on one point from your perspective as message to this uh, uh, this uh, audience. So, Rohit, you want to start? The thing I, I, I mean, look, I, I represent an association of mayors. I'm going to say it's about mayoral leadership. And I do think that the, the fact that mayors more and more, I think, are the visible embodiment of their city and their citizens look to them and they respond to their citizens, it is that voice, I think what you will see is that cities where the mayor is empowered to do a lot on transportation will do a lot on transportation. Cities where mayors can run metros will build metros. Cities where mayors can't run metros will do cycling and so on and so forth. I think the mayoral, mayoral authority will be key because mayoral innovation is the key driver. Can I also ask one, do you hear the issue of pricing as one thing that the mayors are ready to take through in, in the conversations that you're hearing. Um, you may have heard about something we tried in New York. <laughs> uh, and you can ask the mayor tomorrow all about that. Uh, but um, yes, actually. And I think whether it is, it, it's not just cordon pricing like uh, it was in Singapore and London and, and Stockholm, which we promoted for New York but innovative use of technology, particularly on pricing. San Francisco, I think, has one of the, certainly the best system in the United States for dynamic parking pricing. Incredibly controversial, even in an extraordinarily liberal, transit-oriented place like San Francisco, because of that inherent right that you described. Uh, but I think it is that kind of innovation that will come out of the localities, because it's the mayors who see the congestion problems the governors can just go to the more rural part of the state and they're not going to see any congestion. They can get away from it. Final question to you. 
climate change is not a driver, you think, for uh, the way we're going to think about transport in cities in the future? It certainly is. And, you know, the C40 is, is an organization. It's a C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. I think it becomes an overarching construct, but as has been mentioned here, transportation, like so many other aspects of climate change-related policy, affects everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would routinely, when I worked for Mayor Bloomberg, I would be asked, well, you know, really sustainability policy is comprehensive, so why doesn't your office think about education? Why doesn't your office think about health? I'd say, well, actually, the real guy in charge of the sustainability of New York is the mayor, not the guy who, who has that title. We had a small part related to built environment and climate. At the end of the day, a city is a complex ecosystem. It's all interlinked. You can't really separate out climate, land use, quality of life. They're all gotta, they've all got to go in the same direction. Brilliant, brilliant. Mayor, very simple question. What is the one thing that you think national governments should be doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis cities and transport? Yes, but um, I wanted to um, answer the question in connection with uh, the uh, restriction of the number of cars, the uh, car quotas. We thought about uh, imposing a limitation on cars in the city, but uh, we're not responsible for the general economic policy. Uh, this would mean that we would have to uh, set limits for um, the policies in connection with import of cars and taxation of cars. And these are national decisions and international decisions as well, I think. I think uh, in the past year, we've uh, seen that the world has uh, one billion um, vehicles uh, in uh, our planet, one billion, and, and soon we're going to have three, four billion, and then we're going to have uh, uh, to park on the moon because they're not going to be able to um, park here on Earth. So perhaps uh, we could establish some restrictions, and we're discussing this. But a city is an ecosystem, and that ecosystem is to be found somewhere. Perhaps we could establish uh, in our city uh, restricted policies, but the city next door, they sell a lot of vehicles, and those vehicles are going to end up in our city that imposes the, res the restrictions. So what we can do as uh, mayors has limitations. And this has to do with technology and other issues. We have looked at the possibility of establishing a quota for vehicles in our cities because the situation right now is unsustainable. You cannot, in 10 years, double the number of roads in a city because you would have to tear everything down and just build roads. And people have a very short-term vision. So uh, the person is uh, in his car, the, the car is waiting on, on a traffic light, the traffic light uh, is not working, and they damn the mayor, and uh, that's what they do. It's, it's really a very, very complex problem. When you sit down with uh, mayors from Lima, from Mexico, from other places, this is a very serious situation because the driver has a certain, a certain expectation, and that expectation is not rational vis-a-vis -vis the general interest, and people fail to think about this. Now, at the national level, there are certain structural uh, solutions. For example, mass transportation. Now, this is difficult for a city to do by itself. This has to be a national policy. You can reinforce the authority of the mayor, but in our country, we are uh, talking about a general land use law. It's a national law. Um, so a mayor is the local authority, but now we're discussing a land use for the whole country that uh, establishes logic urbanization uh, provisions and that makes growing more orderly. A colleague of mine was uh, saying that uh, we have to have a decentralized model. But this depends on the reality of each city. Our city, Quito, may be densified. And perhaps uh, this is time for us to make that decision. Because uh, if we don't have that, the urban sprawl in Quito is going to grow enormously. So this has to do with a number of things. If we don't revitalize the inner city, if we don't make the historic section of the city 
greener, with more parks, etc. No family is going to go downtown and live downtown. You need parks for and the kids, you need movie theaters, you need um, shopping areas, uh, supermarkets, so people can live in those inner city areas. Uh, we're eating into a uh, break, which will make us very unpopular, so I'm going to uh, request uh, the other speakers to be very sharp. Uh, sir, your, your point. I think somebody asked about the road pricing, and uh, I think somebody has to keep in mind that mayors normally are elected for a shorter period. So we have to see if such unpopular decisions have to be taken in another level, which then will facilitate the implementation. The other element I wanted to talk about is this idea of having sustainable mobility plans. To develop this, you will need to have all parties around the table to sit and agree, because it's not today I have a first, let's say, mayor that agrees on some part, and then the next elections come, another one comes and doesn't follow it up, because investments on infrastructure and things like that take time. So we need a consensus at the local level between the different parties to agree on these sustainable mobility plans. Был задан вопрос по поводу доставки грузов. Это действительно тоже оказывает очень важное and uh, set up a throughput regimen in uh, uh, cities. Uh, sometimes uh, it makes uh, sense to unload a large truck into five smaller vans. Sometimes uh, when there is a window, it makes sense using a dispatch service to uh, let this big truck go through the city. Uh, in uh, St. Petersburg, for instance, uh, when a stadium was being put in place, a special pier was uh, erected so that cargoes can be brought in uh, from the sea and sometimes uh, nighttime uh, can be used to minimize the load on the uh, transportation network in the cities. The most formidable question is, is our problem that economic determinism is what's driving the congestions and inefficiencies of, of cities? I, I wish that the questioner's premise was true. The world would be so much better place if most policy planners were economists and the people listened to them. Um, but uh, more seriously, um, I just want to say that um, um, for, for sustainable urban transport uh, planning um, provision, etc., the empowerment of city leadership, I think, is the most important. And along with that, of course, uh, capacity building of people, uh, and, it's, it's a, and it's a big project, uh, certainly for a country like India, which is large, and so the number of cities we're going to have, etc. I think that really is the biggest issue, to my mind, because things will change a lot over the next 20 years, um, and we don't have the information or the expertise today to know what is going to happen in the next 20 years. So you need to build up systems and city-based uh, leadership which can actually cope with the kind of changes that take place and plan, uh, plan accordingly. And then finally ending with the, the economic sort of issue that uh, I think a simple guiding principle is that people who use transportation in the city ought to be fully paying for it in one way or other, whether it's through taxation, whether it's through uh, devolvement of taxes that they've given to the central government, which then come back to the city, but overall, uh, we would do very well if you keep that simple principle in mind, that if you want a metro, if you want a BRT, if you want any high-speed transit, please understand you're going to have to pay for it. Then we make fewer mistakes. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Please uh, uh, join me in uh, thanking the panel. I think there's a challenge that was raised for all of you which is, please have a discussion here that really matters for people out there, so that we're not seen, as uh, Rakesh has said, a bunch of theoreticians talking things that are not going to be implemented out there. The range of topics that were, that were addressed here, from empowerment of mayors to pricing, to the role of central government, to politics, 
to the nature of uh, transport authorities. All of these have to be done in a way that matches the reality of what we face on a daily basis. We have, what, 10 minutes for a, for a coffee break? Thank you. We actually have 20 minutes for a coffee. You can come for a break in the lobby. Please come back at 11.15. Thank you.